So good evening, everybody out there in uh, Zoom land. Welcome to uh, Learning Environments Australasia Vic Chapter uh, event for June, where we are looking at inclusion in schools part two. I want to start this evening by acknowledging that we're meeting on traditional lands. Tonight, I am actually on Wurundjeri and um, Boonwurrung country. I'm actually in Melbourne, although I normally um, I'm normally on Jaja Warren country, which is part of this kind of this, this extensive Kulin nation right across Victoria. And so we acknowledge uh, elders past, and present and future leaders, future and emerging leaders. Sense of place is really important in, in Indigenous culture. And in many ways, we are really coming together with an exploration of place as Learning Environments Australasia. And tonight in particular, we are focusing in on inclusivity within design spaces. Well, look, I'm going to pick up this evening and we'll get started because I think there's enough participants in the room. Um, we are really, this is part two of a series of um, seminars. The first one being last year where we hosted an inclusion in schools webinar and we heard from uh, a range of voices really starting to explore ideas uh, and models of inclusion, inclusion from policy as well as a practice perspective. But we also heard from panel members who had lived experience and, and very much personal reflections on inclusion in schools and inclusion in the workplace. We, what we wanted to do was we had some feedbacks and we had some fantastic feedback after that session, but we also had some feedback saying, well, let, can we kind of dig a little bit deeper into design? And so for this year, um, we've assembled a stellar cast with the explicit goal of taking some of these kind of ideas, many of them unresolved, many of them um, perhaps contentious um, and, and indefinitely contested, and ar around inclusion and inclusive education and starting to explore some of the practicalities of the design world. We've got three really unique perspectives this evening and I'm going to introduce each of them quite quickly, um, but then I'm going to give each of them an opportunity to chat to, a to chat to us for a few minutes by way of introducing themselves and some of the kind of relevant experiences. And then I've got some questions that we'll launch into, but I also really wanted to open up the opportunity for everybody out there in the, in the Zoom multiverse to be able to put your questions forward. So please use the, the chat function. We've got Georgie and Maya in the background providing technical support, but also monitoring the, the questions. So if you do have questions, please, please be, sh be sure to put those questions in and we'll get to them as soon as we can. We've got a six o'clock hard finish, so let's jump into it. This evening, I've got Cameron Peverett, who is the principal at Colac Specialist School, but he's also the president of the Principals Association of Specialist Schools. And Cameron will tell us about his experience in designing a new school at Colac and also being um, part of an expert panel in designing um, a part of the... Um, uh, a suite of schools that are being designed as part of one of the bundles, or in fact, multiple bundles, I think, Cameron, quite a busy guy. So welcome to you, and I'll pass over to you in just one second. We've also got um, Kate Tregloan, who's the Associate Professor of Teaching and Learning and the Assistant Dean for Teaching Quality here at um, the, Architect uh, the Faculty of Architecture, uh, Planning and Building, uh, and which incorporates Melbourne School of Design. And we've also got uh, Lawrence Robinson, who's the Director of Brand Architects uh, and Regional Executive Member for uh, Learning Environments Australasia. So hello to you all. I'm going to hand over to Cameron first to um, conduct his uh, introduction. I've got the timer on Cameron, so two or three minutes is, is, our, is our maximum. Um, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Uh, two or three minutes, maybe more than what's required. Um, uh, so I suppose a really quick background on my experience. I've um, I taught at uh, Warrnambool Special Developmental School in my early career. Um, I was there for five years. Uh, then I had a, a dip at the mainstream schools and taught at Pamela Primary before becoming a principal at Hamilton Special Developmental School, um, where I was there for seven years as principal. And then 
um, now been at Colac for five years. So all of my teaching um, and principalship experience has been in the southwest of Victoria. Um, but I have had a dip my toe into uh, mainstream teaching as well. And I was very pleased to be teaching grade two, three, fours when I was doing that. Um, over the last three years, I've been the president of the Principals Association of Specialist Schools, which is a, a lovely position to be in where I get to see um, wonderful uh, design of schools. By I get to visit many schools throughout, throughout my uh, journey in this role. Um, and I've also had the privilege of sitting on the board of the Australian Special Education Principals Association, um, which has taken me into state to see, once again, different designs of specialist schools and um, what they potentially look like. I suppose my philosophy, if I was to have one, is that I, my, my view is to make sure that uh, the students are in the schools that best suit them. Um, and the way that we get that is through flexibility um, of design as much as anything. So um, that's more or less me in a nutshell. I want, I, like I said, I'm looking for the right, right students to be in the right schools. And I think there's a, there's a way to go with getting the design principles right, but it must be based on um, inclusion and educational rationale. Yeah, thanks, Cameron. Thanks for that reminder because I think it's, it's while we, we I have introduced this as having a particular focus on design, we certainly do not want to lose sight. And I think this is very unique amongst the LEA community is that we know that there are particular social drivers, educational drivers that then help guide us in our in our design. So it's not so much the design is always guiding what's next. We're very careful listeners, I think, and that's quite a quite an positive attribute for this community. You've also done um, some work quite recently with the VSBA in consulting on bundle schools, as well as having in the middle of a, a build at, at Colac. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the build of Colac is, is an interesting experience because we're, uh, once again, I'm looking around flexible design principles, um, making sure that it is open and warm and accessible to all who come along. We're also taking on a heritage listed building, which has got its own complications to make that accessible in its own right. Um, with the bundle of schools I'm working on, it's very interesting when you talk to architects and all that have got some wonderful ideas around what their perception of inclusion is and just how often they miss the mark with accessibility and flexibility. It's very interesting having conversations around furniture and um, yeah, they say, oh, do you think that this item of furniture will work if we put that across the school? It's like, well, it really depends on the kid and the types of kids and how many of those in you know, um, do we need tables all at the same height or adjustable? Like all of those sorts of questions. It's very fascinating to hear um, some of these things that, that sound wonderful in, in principle, but once it goes into practice and you sort of need to live it and see what, how it works and um, to be able to bring that, those, that insight and that experience into the design space, it's, it's really interesting. And it's really nice. I was a part of the Endeavour Hills uh, design, which is a brand new specialist school that opened up in Victoria. Um, and it was very interesting to see how late in the stage there were still many tweaks to be made um, mm -hmm. about making it really accessible and being able to provide the most open and robust programs and um, educational opportunities that would cater for all of the students who are entering into that school. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to, to diving in a little bit deeper and getting you to reflect on some of the insights you've had um, through all of those projects across the evening. So welcome. Thanks so much for coming along. We've also, we're also really lucky to have, a pre, I think, a really unique perspective from uh, Kate this evening, who is uh, really a renowned researcher focusing specifically in uh, inclusive inclusivity. Uh, and so, Kate, I'll just hand over to you because I, I think that um, it'd be great to hear about some of your projects across the last few years or decade or so. I think you've been working on this for some time. Yes, indeed. Thanks very much, Scott. And it is me kind of hiding behind the gloom. It's really um, tricky to try and talk without waving my hands. But I do have some pictures of some um, projects and research that I've been working on. Shall I try and share the screen and I can speak to that a little bit so at least there's a little bit of um, colour and movement? Please do. Let's see how we go. So, um, I mean, I'll, I'll be quick about it, um, but at the same time, I guess one of the things that um, is really lucky, I, I do come from a variety of different directions and that's a really exciting thing. I'm a, an architect, um, but um, I'm also um, clearly really interested in education and particularly education of 
of um, professionals who work in built environments. Um, before we start, I did want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri and um, to recognise the elders past, present and emerging um, and the learning and making that have taken place on these lands for a very long time. And it is a wonderful thing to join that tradition and that conversation. Um, I will kind of power through this a little bit. Um, tell me if it's not working. All right. So um, this is a kind of a picture of um, all of, of, not all of, a selection of the projects that I've been working on. And it is a decade. It's since 2012. The most important thing for me to say is to point to the list of different people who've been contributing at the bottom. Um, so, I mean, I'm not the only architect who's been involved in these projects, but, you know, a consistent um, contributor. But I think one of the things that um, I have found to be really key in these conversations is having a variety of different perspectives. I work really closely with colleagues from health. Um, my focus has mostly been around a design of housing for people with disability, but then I kind of come at, at teaching and learning from another direction. So I just kind of wanted to say that. There are three different types of projects that I thought I would talk through um, very quickly. Um, some post-occupancy evaluation, which is coming and looking at buildings that have been built and trying to understand what's working and what's not um, about those so that we can learn from those experiments. Um, the development of some kind of innovative tools to teach developing and learning architects about what good design might look like for people with disability and some of the um, the issues that and the implications of some of that design decision making as well as a series of research projects looking at international best practice um, so um, these this is a set of these projects that we were looking at across Victoria so, um, for the um, post occupancy evaluation framework for Ripple, which is funded through the TAC. Um, and part of what we did there was to start to unpack what good design might look like. Um, and I, I guess one of the comments that com that Cameron and yourself just made, Scott, was really around listening and. Um, I, I think that's such an important thing. Design starts from listening far, far <laughs> in advance of any doing, you know. Good design really starts from listening and listening to place as well as people, um, as well as need. And so I think that was a really key part of that project. Um, I, I won't step through these. I'm happy to, but I'm aware that there is, I know you've got a plan for the session, Scott, so I don't want to eat up too much time showing these. It's great that you've got them because I think that it, as part of your answers across the evening, we could very easily jump back into these and that'd be, that'd be Oh, fantastic. okay. Okay, super. Well, by all means, give us a quick overview. Don't, don't stop. Okay, I'll show this one and then I'll kind of stop and, and let you move on. I guess what I would really say about this, because I think this can kind of cover some of the things that um, might be good introductory remarks. Um, one of the important things about this particular project, which was an early formative one, so way down the left hand end of that timeline, was to be able to think through what good was going to look like. So how we could really understand what success was going to look like in these projects. But the other really important thing was to develop some ways to understand and show people how an environment that looks kind of great is experienced differently by different people. So we developed this tool to visualise and to measure the experience of people with disability and this particular person who is in a wheelchair living in this space, um, the, the purple area shows the kind of limits of what that person can reach. And the green people are people, support people who are in your kitchen all the time, in your laundry all the time. And so it gave us an opportunity to really try to communicate and to represent the experience of a place for different individuals who inhabit it. It's really easy to imagine what it's going to look like. Um, and this became a tool that allowed us to have some really great conversations with the designers and the other people who are involved in developing um, these schemes. So I'll leave it there, but I'm really happy to drop back in um, 
whenever that's helpful. Yeah, that's great, Kate. Thank you so much. And, and I know it's frustrating without a camera, but you've done well so far by showing us some of those things. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to hearing about some of the research. Yeah, Lawrence, uh, it'd be great to uh, get a few comments from you, particularly I know you've done a lot of work in um, inclusive schools and in special schools and specialist schools. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, the floor is yours. Yeah, I guess I've been working in this space now for probably about 15 years or more. Um, and it's been fascinating to see the sort of change of policy and the change of attitudes to inclusion and the whole idea of inclusion. And um, when when I started sort of in the area back in 2007, um, a particular project we got at that time was Manor Lakes Peter 12 and Specialist College. And uh, the brief came out and it was for a P-12 school and a special school, um, special SDS school on a, on a site out in Manor Lakes. And um, I think the department were thinking at that time that it was actually going to be two separate schools. And um, we, talking to the client uh, and, and the community out there, it was, no, we actually want, we want to sort of take up this idea of it takes a village to raise a child. And we, we want this to be, um, something that is much more inclusive and connected than, than two separate schools with a big fence between them. And so at that time when we put up a proposal to actually embed the special school within the mainstream school as a series of almost like learning communities within a main school, um, it actually um, it actually opened a Pandora's box and it actually took us a lot of time to actually get acceptance of that idea um, and and to get that to get that in that design accepted and then over time um, and actually to, to treat the special school like a, just like a series like you would with a, a normal school a Peter 12 school actually treat the the special school component of the brief as just being another series of learning communities that were age group um, uh, designed for different age groups so the the little kids had different needs to the bigger kids the life skills training um, and the idea that the special, the kids that were actually enrolled as special students were only really in those learning communities to the extent that they needed to be and the rest of the time they were out, out in the rest of the school. And um, just harking also back to kind of about being careful listeners, I think that is critical. And, and when we were talking to the kids um, at the time, it was they just want to be with their mates. You know, that, that's really what they want. You know, like um, they don't see a distinction. They don't see this whole, whole idea that they just want to be with their mates and, and they will do be with their mates to the extent that they can. Um, and then from there, it sort of moved, um, you know, we, we started talking about universal design a few years ago um, and, and the idea that universal design might be a way to sort of look at this. And I think now we are getting much more nuanced about the idea of inclusion as, a, as an idea. Um, and I don't just see that as accessibility because it's not, just about accessibility, it's, it is about inclusion. And um, I, I like to think of it as who are we including? And, um, you know, is there a, a particular set of, su a subset of people that we're trying to include? And I don't think it is. I think um, I think it's a continuum and, and all students are on a continuum and all students have a different need. And that's the, that's the way we like to approach the sort of design process. Cameron, um, I, which I, we have been. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah go, go sorry. along. I was just going to say that we've been working on the bundles with with Cameron as one of the uh, with designing um, in conjunction with designing on the 2021 bundles, which are, we've got some inclusive schools in there, and uh, more recently on the 2024 bundles, and, and working with Cameron and his team and trying to embed that flexibility into that as well. Yeah, nice, nice segue. I'm going to jump across to you, Cameron, and ask you to reflect a little bit on, on what Lawrence is saying. And what, what can you add to that idea about what we what we already know about um, inclusive design? What, 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 what lessons can we have you picked up from that process? Yeah, I think um, flexibility in design is probably one of the key aspects. Um, as long, I mean, it has to be based on, I, I think designing of schools, it's primarily going back to the educational rationale. It's making sure that we've got the right systems and supports in place that can be inclusive across all varieties of what it means to be in a school community. So it's not just the um, educational components, but it's the social components and, you know, the play and the care and the therapy and the, all of that together so that 
that we try to reduce the amount of isolation and stigma um, as we possibly can within any given space. Um, I think above above a, a sort of everything, I suppose, we also want to make sure that no matter what, that we're providing the safest space possible for all students and that which retains the student's dignity also at all times. Um, obviously, the disability presents itself in a variety of different ways and a lot of it can be hidden, um, but a lot of it can also be quite um, obvious. And I think as long as what whatever design principles are in place, it allows students to be able to access education at the same on the same rate, the same pace, the same type as their peers, um, but in a way that uh, the students can access it, it at their point of need. I think the, the environment needs to be flexible enough to be able to adapt to that so that no child is um, isolated, I suppose, through the, any program that's being provided. Yeah, can you, can you pick up on that idea of dignity? It's something that comes up a lot in schools when I'm working with um, special development schools or schools that are looking towards mainstream schools, looking towards um, being more inclusive. But it's often quite a, um, I think often in mainstream schools, it's a little bit elusive. Have you got some examples you might, you might draw on from your recent experiences? I think that, well, the concept of, of dignity um, I suppose there's obviously societal norms around what it means to to be to, have, to show and display and be considerate of a student's dignity or a person's dignity. Where we have students who struggle with social norms and expectations, sometimes that can be a little bit muddled up and get a bit murky as to, you know, what is the child expressing themselves through their behaviours or through their words uh, versus what is something that's likely to isolate them because of those behaviours or the way that they're conducting themselves. And, you know, I, my school is a multimodal specialist school, which basically means uh, that I have students who IQ are 70 and below. Um, so we have those kids who are a little bit fringy as far as, you know, um, would suit well with the right adaptations in a mainstream setting, but the parents have chosen to send their children to us, to those that have quite um, significant, profound disabilities. Um, and I think that you find that sometimes those kids that, that do struggle to... Um, stick to what we would consider I suppose conventions uh, within a school setting or in society where you know through their frustrations they may scream or yell or you know, in some cases they may remove their clothes all that sort of stuff that's a way of the way they're expressing their their needs or wants they're either wanting something or to get away from something or whatever they haven't quite got the language yet Sometimes we, we want to make sure that they're not put in a compromised, a compromised position or that they're not further isolating themselves by, you know, being in an environment that's not as accepting or, or able to accept the, those behaviours where we can take that and learn from it and move on. So we help the students to express themselves in, in different and more social, you know, more acceptable ways, I suppose. Hmm. Kate, in your work, have you come across... Um... Uh, the importance of dignity or other kind of central concepts that you might you might draw on as, as really guiding inclusive design? Yeah, but look, um, very much so. And it's really fascinating to hear this conversation and some of the overlaps as well as some of the differences in um, some of the work that we were doing. I was just having a hunt through the slides because, I, you know, I'm no good with my pictures. Um, but um, so I can share this thing, which I hope is going to work. Um, is that working now? Can you see something? Yes? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, good. All right. Um, this is a way that early on we uh, worked out, and this is, again, it's about housing, but there are some kind of overlaps here. Um, and I guess the part that I would really note in what, um, what uh, Cameron was just saying was about the, the capacity of the importance of independence for a person who might be living in a supported living environment and the, um, the capacity of that environment to help them to be in control of the support that they ask for. Um, so their, um, their capacity to then control that using technology but also other means um, as well as um, to be able to pursue what's important to them. Within a school setting, I expect that's about um, clearly about supporting learning and learning engagements, but it's also, I guess, the other part of the conversation is about how many people are involved in these environments. 
you know, that the environments really need to support um, staff and the other um, other students or um, um, other people who are involved. And so the design of those environments is both physical as well as social as well. So I, I, I guess I kind of just really highlight that. Of course, um, as an architect, I think a lot about buildings, but then I really think it's important that we're thinking about the people who are in the middle of those buildings and the building's role to support um, as much as they can um, so, uh, positive relationships and um, to support it, positive interactions between people. So it's, it's about both of those things, but I also think it's important that both of those things are designed and designed together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I guess the other, the other part of this that I would just kind of point out that might be relevant to some of this conversation is that kind of notion of flexibility. And in our work, we um, identified flexibility in three ways, partly because it came up earlier. Some of it is about kind of customization and modification of an environment to suit an individual. So that's one way of thinking about flexibility. Another way of thinking about flexibility um, is that, that um, an environment can respond to a person's changing needs over time. Um, and that can be an important thing. And also that an environment is designed to anticipate a range of needs. Um, and I think um, it was uh, Cameron earlier on who was talking about um, there isn't kind of one design. <laughs> It's going to be inclusive of everybody, and you know, um, trying to imagine that there's some. This is this is. I think this kind of really key thing, and it's amazing um, that there isn't one design that's suddenly going to fit everybody in. Um, it's uh, th there's no kind of average here that's that's going to work, and so really kind of thinking about design as a way of responding and as being responsive. Um, seems really central to this conversation. Um, okay. Yeah, that's great. And I think, Lawrence, I might come to you on this next one because um, uh, we've heard a range of factors that need to be considered from the very idea of inclusivity through to dignity, um, a, a range of understandings of flexibility, um, the fact that there's really these spaces need to be particularly customizable and that there's not really kind of one answer. If you've met one autistic child then you've only met one autistic child, you know, you haven't kind of met all of them all at once or everybody mm. with Down syndrome. But I, I'm aware of the, of the fact that once it comes to the design process, there's also, you know, there's kind of a range of other pressures that we might not have touched on yet. So I'm wondering if you, if you can reflect a little bit on some of those other pressures that exist in kind of the design world when it gets down to the, the nuts and bolts and thinking about policy and thinking about area schedules and uh, allocation yeah. of toilets and a whole range of things. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, obviously for most of the people in the room who have designed design schools, you know that we get a, a facility brief and it has a certain amount of area. And, and then if it's an inclusion school, it gets a bit more area. And, and one of the, the first challenges is actually to work out where to best distribute that area. Um, in the most effective and flexible way. And um, I think we know what inclusion isn't. Like it's not just providing some more accessible toilets and a, and a changing places and a couple of um, small group spaces. It, it's really about trying to create um, uh, affordances. And I know you've talked about affordances before, Scott, and, and that, that, but I like that idea as a way of thinking about inclusive space. What are the affordances in the space for people of different needs and and how can we create those different settings and um, so th at one level it's there is a certain level of customization that can happen and and the adaptability of the space but I think it also helps to think about the space as providing the widest range of sensory and physical settings that you can to enable um, occupation by people of different needs. Um, I think it's also important to remember that when you when you design to include a certain subset of people, you may well be excluding another subset of people in doing that. And so thinking about um, how you, and in some cases that's necessary. So in some cases you need to actually design something in a particular way to enable a subset of people to be able to use that particular part of the space. But how you do that without um, with minimising the amount of exclusion that takes place in that. Um, yeah, so I think 
there's always in schools there's always pressure on space and unless um unless you're very clear about how you're going to use that space it can actually just get taken over by by other uses in the school and so that's one of the things that we've been really cognizant about in the in the bundle designs that we've been doing that we actually are very clear about where we're deploying that space and making sure that that space is um is able to be used for its intended use and not just get taken over as part of the mainstream. And we have had other schools where we've designed these sorts of spaces and they have been taken over because the um, the principal or the leadership team has been such under such stress on other fronts that they've actually they've just taken over the space the space that's intended as uh, for, for inclusive activities. Uh, they've just taken it over and used it for other uses. So that, that's also a challenge. Mm. Yeah, Kate, I wonder from your perspective, uh, what a couple of things that Lawrence has just touched on um, is the risk of uh, designing something in such a way that then potentially excludes somebody else. I wonder if you've, you've come across some of these ideas in your research or um, in, in certainly in the literature, I know it exists. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I mean, one example um, would be some of our work with on that, that little video that I showed earlier. Um, one of our, so there was ethnographic research, which kind of in some ways means following people around and watching what they do. Um, and uh, when exploring um, the design of um, a, uh, a, a kind of wardrobe dressing space, the person who was actually living there had a hemiplegia meeting that they were not able to use their um, arm on the left hand side. And the design of that space meant that, that, that they couldn't reach anything that was stored. However, if it was a mirror design for that individual, it would have been fine. And that to me is this really, so if they had had a right hand hemiplegia and they weren't able to use their right hand, it would have been fine. Um, to me, that became this kind of useful symbol of how important it is to kind of, to tailor an environment um, to an individual's need. And I think that's a, that's a kind of fairly obvious um, example. And clearly there are, um, uh, different types of disabilities that caught that may have to do with um, uh, vision or hearing that um, therefore imply different experiences of space and spaces. Um, I don't think that um, the solution is necessarily to design for everybody. I do think it's possible to design to exclude the, um, the as few people as possible but I also think that people's needs can change over time and can change in, in really significant ways. And so uh, uh, having a view to flexibility and having um, capacity within the design to respond to that um, seems to me to be the best way forward. Um, I think we need to really be careful of the questions and the challenges that we set for ourselves, um, but, and also really think about um, allowing people the, or <laughs> providing people with the capacity to ask for what they need as well. Um, because I think responding to individuals' needs and requests, giving them the power to ask for what they want, um, is an important aspect of this as well. That um, design for inclusivity is not something that is done to people with a disability, that actually can respond to um, what they need out of this. Yeah, and that's a nice way, Cameron, I'd like you to reflect on something that you mentioned a little bit earlier, and that is just uh, the importance of listening and as starting points for trying to establish a genuinely established community need or get a sense of community need. And I, I, I'd really appreciate your some more reflections on things that have been successful of insights that you've had across time. I think finding the balance um, between having something that is, you know, open and inclusive for all and also being uh, warm and responsive, I suppose, to the needs of the, of the cohort. I've, I've just thrown in the chat a couple of, I suppose, design principles that I've spoke, been speaking about with um, in my current school setting, which um, we're, we're very unfortunate in as much as um, my current school is all relocatable buildings, none of them fit for purpose. Um, so trying to shoehorn 
um, you know, particular student needs into buildings that don't allow that has been a real challenge. And one of the big challenges um, that we found was that the lack of ceiling hoists was one thing that came up. And because of um, the design of the buildings and the spaces and the, and the um, ability to have these very functional things that these students needed, but only located in one area, I mean, they couldn't necessarily follow their peers throughout the school as they aged um, with them. So it was either um, they, the student was getting older and would be end up, end up with younger peers or their peers were limited to be in or near that space. So couldn't grow through the school, um, which, which sort of certainly jumps on a bit of Kate's principles there as well. So really listening to what the parents want and what the, where the kids felt and where their identity sat as well was really important to us. The other thing I suppose was around um, the flexibility of, of space in that what, we are, what we're what trying to design, um, which sometimes architects don't like to hear as such, is something that's actually quite vanilla and bland. So then as we have kids who may have particular stimulus, uh, stim you know, reactions, I suppose, to particular stimuli, that, that they can be added and deleted as required so that we do want to have a warm and dynamic and bright environment, but that doesn't suit all of our kids. And sometimes it can be overstimulating and they can struggle to concentrate and uh, attend to their work and all of that sort of stuff. So we're really trying to create spaces that where it is appropriate, we can have that fancy stuff and get things really bright and bubbly and colorful. But at the same time, if it needs to be basically a a much more uh, downplayed sort of uh, stable environment, well then um, I think that we've got the opportunity to do that. And at the same space where we try to get a combination of both of having breakout spaces to kind of go a little bit into what Lawrence was saying that making sure the spaces are treated in the way that they're initially designed. So you have large spaces and small spaces and spaces where you can have more um, sensory items and equipment if that's where they need to be able to break out into or out into open outdoor space because I learn better out there and you know that flexibility of movement a somewhat controlled movement I think is also important I just happened to have a conversation with the principal today um, around a student that I got it with a wheelchair who he was looking at the design of his school which was, which was only built about four or five years ago and going I really wish that we had a, had some automatic doors or at least something that would have allowed our students in wheelchairs the ability to move through spaces under their own volition without always having to have somebody there with them to open the door for them. And that really resonated quite strongly with me going, wow, I need to make sure I bring that into my new space so that that once again promotes that independence of the child over their own, uh, you know, their, not only their learning, but their ability to move around spaces and own spaces. Yeah. That it's a nice opportunity for me to ask the question from Lindy Burton in the Q and A, and I'll start with you, Cameron, but I'll open it up to everybody. And that is that she's interested in hearing you speak a bit more about the um, an earlier comment that is reflecting on the social impacts of inclusive design. Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, I can only, I suppose, speak from my experience, and my experience has primarily been in in specialist settings. And sometimes there's a little bit of a bit of a furphy, I like to call it out there, that students um, with intellectual disabilities and all that don't uh, reach or do not have the same opportunities as their mainstream peers to develop strong social relationships or, or uh, develop their um, social skills because they are only around other students like them. You know, the, that that you know, trying to put this in a fairly diplomatic way, I guess that our main Sometimes there is greater isolation by having our students with, with additional needs in spaces where all the students are of a particular type being, a, I would say, a mainstream type. Whereas in a specialist setting, particularly ones like mine that are, that's multimodal, they're exposed to all different types of people. And I would argue that our, the principles around the way that we operate in the spaces we design are fully inclusive because as long as they meet a particular category, they're in. They're in our school. As long as they're eligible, they're in. So we are as inclusive as a space as, they, as that gets because no matter what you come in with, that, that we suit the program and the space to what you require to be able to access your education to the best of um, our ability, I suppose, to, to do so. So um, I'm not sure if I've gone off on a tangent there, but that was, that was sort of, um, I think, 
to be able to be responsive to the needs of the individual as well as to cohort um, from day to day, I think is a really important design component. Yeah, great. And I might open that up to Lawrence and, and, and to Kate to, to chip in there as well. Yeah, I was just going to add to Cameron's comment there about um, the social inclusivity is that it cuts both ways too, that when you can create a truly inclusive environment and, and you have a, a wider range of um, people in there and a, a wider diversity of people in that environment, it's I think it's actually beneficial to the, the mainstream students as well in that they that they come to understand um, students with special needs a bit more than than if they were off in another special school. That that if they're if they're in that environment and they're getting used to them, and that's certainly the the case at Manor Lakes. That you know having the special students as part of their everyday experience, I think, has actually made them more well rounded and accepting as well. Can I just, um, can I just yeah. jump in there just one with that, Lawrence? That you know, as with as far as the students who with have the a part of the program, students with disabilities with the Department of Education, fifty two percent are are in the mainstream schools. Mm. So yeah, the the majority, albeit a small one, um, actually exists within the mainstream. So you're exactly right there that they 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 exist, but they're not necessarily always acknowledged and recognised within the mainstream settings. Mm. And uh, just also from the, just harking back to the sort of thing about the environment and Cameron talking about the idea that you, you start with a bland environment, although I'd like to think about other words than bland, but um, certainly environments, you start with an environment that's not overstimulating, but I think also as an architect, we need to think about um, all of the senses. So not, not just thinking about colours, but the acoustic environment is really important. Um, for, for kids with special needs, some kids with special needs, they respond very badly to a poor acoustic environment, very well to a good acoustic environment. Um, tactility is important. The, the idea that you can actually engage directly with the buildings through touch, um, the ability to adapt light levels um, to different settings, I think is also very important. So um, as designers, we don't just need to think about the actual configuration and the nature, but we have to think about the, all of those other things when we're designing the spaces as well. Yeah, Kate, I might get you to uh, bring you in here and, and ask you to reflect on a couple of these ideas. No, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking, I think it's a fantastic conversation. One of the things that I think is really interesting is um, the kind of expectations that we have and perhaps the opportunities that we can open for people to engage with environments in different ways. Um, so I totally agree that the visual is, of course, really important, but all sorts of sensory aspects of environments are key um, and key to different individuals um, however they might be defined in different ways. Uh, different people are more or less sensitive to sound, of course, and, and we know that. And um, kids with special needs, of course, have um, perhaps in many cases even more um, sensitivity in that way. Um, but I'm also, I guess I'm thinking about the other ways that spaces are used and the affordances. Someone used the term affordances early, which is just a fantastic idea. The way that um, designed objects and spaces can be can be used not how they should be used not even how they have been used but how they can be used in a variety and um and in ways that haven't even been imagined and so i guess um one of the things that i think this goes back to that idea of listening really but listening with all of our senses as people who hope to influence positive environments as well so by listening i guess you know, one can listen with one's eyes by looking really closely at what um, what an individual student might make of a space, what affordances they might perceive and what they might be making out of those and then how we can learn from that and um, provide those kinds of opportunities or augment those kinds of opportunities where they exist and keep looking out for the next one. Thanks, Kate. That's great. Another, another question, um, and I'll stick with you, Kate, to start off with, and then and and then throw across to Lawrence and Cameron, coming from the um, the Zoom multiverse with from Belinda, asking really about um, 
you know, current theories connecting nature um, and the use of natural materials into, um, into schools, so biophilic principles. Um, and she's really just asking, I think if I'm reading that question and thinking and talking all at the same time, which is clearly too many things, uh, <laughs> wondering if you could reflect on, on, on the role of that and their, at least their kind of perceived calming effects and, and, and potential, potential role for biophilic design. Yeah, look, I mean, there's fantastic um, research more broadly looking at the inclusion of natural materials and um, experience of natural phenomena. So I'm going to talk about that kind of in a slightly broader way um, as part of, part of health environments. Um, and so I think I would suggest that we can think of um, other environments and the healthy aspects of them. So there's some really great research about the design of, um, as I say, um, spaces that are specifically designed um, as as health environments. And by that, I mean hospitals or um, perhaps residential health facilities. But if we, we can certainly learn from all of those and then bring some of that knowledge into other spaces that people inhabit. Um, I, I, I don't think it's a kind of a long or difficult stretch to think about um, what it's like to be in a space that has um, a connection to the ground that we can feel in a solid way between beneath our feet um, or beneath ourselves and um, fresh air that can reach us cold or warm, depending on where we are in the country, um, in comparison to being in um, some kind of a box in the sky. Both of these have kind of fantastic things about them, um, but um, there is a kind of a grounding quality that is good for um, many of us as animals. And uh, that's, that's a good, good, um, good quality and a well defended quality in the research. Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go on on, on that, that point that um, there is a lot of research in the health and wellness area about this to say that uh, hospitals that have views out to nature or even um, the research shows have green painted walls or curtains, um, the, that the view to nature actually can improve the, the healing outcomes and speed up the healing and reduce the number of days in hospital. Um, so there is a lot of research around that that is actually out there and published. Um, anecdotally, we've seen it in some of our, in a lot of our projects where we've managed to do that. Certainly, the the 2021 school bundles that, that we've done with Design Inc. We've focused very strongly on the idea of connection to nature, um, and we're getting a, a lot of feedback about student behaviour in those environments because they are muted um, colours that are related to the landscape and so on. I think we're getting a lot of good feedback. Um, We've also had feedback from some of the, the playground work that, that we've done with um, some of our landscape architects that, that the, the playgrounds that are really built around nature play rather than having a lot of uh, artificial elements in them have a very calming effect. And um, one of our councils actually came back to us after a while on one project and said that there was a child that they knew about that had ADHD um, that had come from a kinder that hadn't had a strong nature play sense in the the, the playground into one of ours and that, that it completely calmed them down and then completely changed their behaviour. So um, I, I think it's a very important aspect of the design. And um, you know, I remember Ben telling me that he went to visit one of, Ben Cleveland telling me he went to visit one of our community centres uh, and actually just loved watching the kids hug the rammed earth wall. They just, they loved it so much they would actually go up and hug the wall in the mornings. So. I'm, I'm sure it's a thing. That's a ringing endorsement, Lawrence. <laughs> I might, I might, we've got another sort of five minutes or so left. And Cameron, uh, unless you want to pick, pick up on any particular one of those ideas, I might change, change tact ever so slightly. Yeah, well, probably just really quickly. Look, I think that tone of space is, is really important and whatever that looks like. Because when I say that I want things to be toned down and vanilla, it doesn't mean white walls. Mm. You know, it means that we can things down and i think that you would absolutely love the current design that we've got for our play spaces in particular where we have really gone back to nature and we've got lots of rocks and shrubs and a little creek for the kids to sort of um play and so a lot of that sensory stuff that that nate that native log out in colac we're out in basically the bush anyway um we've made sure that we put those aspects back in because we know how important that is for the student engagement but also just their general development 
there's a couple of questions I'd really like to try and cover off on nice and quickly. We've got one from, from Lindy Burton again. Um, did, I, did I ask you a question before, Lindy? I think I did, but we'll stick with you anyway. That's okay. It's a, it's a ripper. Um, is more about how often um, children who are living with a disability are included in the user group and design briefing process. And any examples you may have of that having happened recently? Well, I suppose for us, um, the new school that we're that we're putting for. We, we have um, a, a well-established uh, student representative council and school captains and, and that as well. And they have very much been a big part of the conversation about, it, right back to the initial conversation when we were advocating to get a new school, that they they really told us very clearly what they wanted. And that, they, that almost became about a big part of our non-negotiables. So we've involved them, um, that leadership group representing the students, um, a, a, a big part along the way of the journey to go, does this suit, is this, is this something you would like to, to see? Is this something that you would use, something you would enjoy, all of that sort of stuff. And um, no, we've, we've absolutely made sure of that. And even our current space um, in a pretty poor, poor site, um, we would, if we're, if we're exploring a new piece of play equipment or whatever, we actually want to, we bring it to the students to go, how do you feel? Is, is this something you would engage in? And you know, what do you reckon about it? And you know, there, and there's certain, certain, definitely certain, some aspects that we just through observation we see which bits of equipment or play spaces or or even spaces within the classroom where do they go? What are they most engaged and involved in? So sometimes it's observational um, as much as actually generally sitting down and asking them and having a powwow in any of their their meetings <laughs> that I will invite myself to and go tell me what you think about this, guys. <laughs> I just jump in on this point a little bit. Um, that's just fantastic, Cameron. Thank you very much for that. I, I just note on some of the research work that we did, we kind of thought about it. There's the observation of people using the space. There's also the kind of traces that get left behind in buildings. And some of our research work was about looking for those. For, and I used to think about it a little bit like clothes that fit or don't fit. And we could observe, for example, um, where there were um, spaces that were occupied by a person in a wheelchair, the corners get knocked off the walls or there are kind of scrapes down the wall, which kind of starts to tell you mm, maybe this is a bit too tight or a little bit in the wrong position and it can give you some clues about what to um, explore. Looking at other spaces and outside spaces, um, it's also really possible to see paths of travel, like where people are traveling back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so there are these kind of great traces that get left behind when people use spaces and we can learn from those as well. So um, I, I just kind of love that idea. And I might jump in there and just sort of maybe talk the idea of um, briefing with, with kids and, and um as part of the design process. And I think it depends on the project very much for us that if we're working with an individual school where we have a cohort that exists, that certainly we always try and involve the, the kids, the students in the consultation and um, around the design in a number of different ways. It, it's much harder on the bundles where you're designing um, bundles of school who you don't know even who, who the community is going to be. Um, I think Kate talked before about tailoring environments to the individuals. And I think one of the challenges in a school is you don't know who your individual is going to be. And, uh, you know, the, the cohort tends to change um, each year and, and even within years. So um, we do have to make some assumptions, but, you know, it's just building up a level of experience about what works and what doesn't work in these environments. I'm going to take a liberty and go for two more minutes and just give you a little bit of time each to talk about the importance of um, designing these spaces for adults. So schools that will also factor in um, inclusive design for teachers, but also inclusive design for potentially for parents who may um, have some sort of neurodiversity or some sort of disability. Um, I, I think we sometimes we can get a bit um, focused in on the students and rightly so, but I don't want to neglect the, the role of adults in these spaces. So I'm wondering if you've got some reflections on those. I might start with you, Lawrence. Um, I guess it's not something we've thought about a lot because usually what we do for the students will quite often work for the adults. Um, again, I think it's just um, 
making sure that when you're deploying the space that you have to put to these uses, that they're they're deployed in an effective way and that they don't, they don't um, have too much opportunity just to be taken over, which is which is a big issue in schools, I think. Yeah, but yeah. also you know, front gates. Um, you know, just reflecting on some other projects that have where where you've got where you get much better community acceptance. That, like trying to avoid front fences. I always try and avoid fences as much as I can, even though it's policy to fence our schools, um, because fences to me just send the wrong message about the school as an inclusive place. Mm -hmm. I think we've been really considerate of our of our design to make sure that it's open to the community as well. There's been some very interesting conversations around hearing augmentation um, and hearing loops and all that sort of stuff about how we're we making sure that it caters for the needs of students and visitors. Um, part of our initial brief um, around where we're going to is that we want to make sure that um, not only was it warm and welcoming, that was our number one priority, um, amongst what well, with safety and stuff, but we wanted to make sure that there were um, that it was basically dead flat. That we wanted to make sure that it, if we had um, an adult or uh, you know whoever was who was um, in a wheelchair that under their own steam that they were no they were not restricted um, by that. And you know we'll actually um, you know we have we're considering that we've got a, a potential staff member that we're looking at who's got osteogenesis imperfecta type two. And his wheelchair ban, and which made us also really heavily reflect. Well, if she was to become a member of our staff, um, what would her needs be to make sure that she could access, you know, all of the spaces within the schools as as best as possible? Fairly fortunate that we wouldn't, wouldn't have to do much, much modification at all because we're already equipped that way, which is really nice. But yeah. it's another thing moving forward in the future, making sure we maintain that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Kate, I might, I might just come to you for some final comments. Oh, thank you. Um, I mean, it's terrific to hear about, I guess, considerations of community that is are so broad and um, the uh, and thinking about people who might come and teach and a whole variety, I expect, of different um, different people who may need to work in these spaces as well as um, students who are studying there or learning there. Um, so, I mean, I, clearly, I think it's really key that. Um, uh, all members of the community are able to participate in such important places that are such, there's such important and that play such important roles within our community more broadly. And so um, making those spaces where everyone is able to take part in that conversation about how um, the young people of, of our society are growing and learning. Um, I think that's that's really key here and really key that um, there's capacity for everybody to be as in, involved as they can and they want to be um, within those within those kinds of roles. Yeah, I think the far reaching impacts for inclusive design for students, for, for community members, for parents, it's pretty clear. And tonight it's also been really clear, I think, that um, these, this is a complex uh, environment that we're working in. And there's not really a single answer, but there are definitely um, kind of productive leads that we can take and insights that we can gather up in order to kind of improve the, the collective knowledge. And so tonight, I really want to thank you, Lawrence, Cameron and Kate for joining us and sharing so much of your knowledge. I also really want to thank everybody who has come along and joined us in the, the, the Zoom um, environment. We've had some really good chat uh, activity and some really good Q&A activity. There's clearly a high level of engagement and we, we could probably talk for another two or three hours, but we won't. What we might do is, is run another webinar in the future. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate you. Your, your expertise and your willingness to come and, and join us tonight. And I, the, the impact of that in the learning environments community, I think is, is will be substantial. So thank you, Kate, very much. Thank you, Cameron. And thanks so much to you, Lawrence. Um, and we will, we, will, we will sign off and say good night, everybody. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll leave the, the webinar going for a few minutes so we don't just cut you off. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all. It's been great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Fascinating discussion. Yeah, indeed. Oh, I really, I'm, I really enjoyed that. I'm really sorry that I can't wave my hands at everybody. <laughs> <laughs>